One of the finest poems in Mr. Wallace Stevens's first book, Harmonium, was entitled Sea Surface Full of Clouds. For a while, this poem was thought to be unencumbered by meaning. However, not long ago, one little magazine published an explication of it which required eight pages of text and a rather large chart. All of Mr. Stevens's poems have meaning. And indeed, one of the remarkable things about his work is its thematic unity. Mr. Stevens remarked early in his career that it's important for a poet to discover a point of view and to stick to it. To fidget with points of view, he said, leads always to new beginnings and incessant new beginnings lead to sterility. Hmm. Mr. Stevens's work is concerned with a single great subject, the relation of human imagination to the real world. But what I most prize in his poetry is its flexibility and inclusiveness. Mr. Stevens's instrument is so subtle he can say almost anything and embody almost any contradictions. The basic tone of his poetry is meditation, yet he can pass in a single line from playfulness to grandeur. One of the major voices of our time, Mr. Wallace Stevens. what was in the script, then the theater was changed to something else. Its past was a souvenir. It has to be living to learn the speech of the place. It has to face the men of the time and to meet the women of the time. It has to think about war and it has to find what will suffice. It has to construct a new stage. It has to be on that stage. And like an insatiable actor, slowly and with meditation, speak words that in the ear, in the delicatest ear of the mind, repeat exactly that which it wants to hear, at the sound of which an invisible audience listens, not to the play, but to itself, expressed in an emotion as of two people, as of two emotions becoming one. The actor is a metaphysician in the dark, twanging an instrument, twanging a wiry string that gives sounds passing through sudden rightnesses, wholly containing the mind below which it cannot descend beyond which it has no power to rise. It must be the finding of a satisfaction, and maybe of a man skating, a woman dancing, a woman combing, the poem, the act, the mind. Thank you. 
fur is various and is known by the rabbit head like Corolla. Bergamot is a big, husky flower, or rather a weed with a spicy smell. Mignonette, I must remember. It is a vigorous flower with a dry, old fashioned goodness of smell. It blooms at the top of the stem, although the rest is covered with little calyxes which assist its sturdy appearance. Poppies are exquisite. The last one I held was the color of a princess cheek, although they are generally a fiercer scarlet. The last breath of wind shimmers over them, and the impression is daffodil. It is impossible to say more. They are so splendid. This time of year reminds me of the countryside around Reading when I was a boy. I must have spent half my youth wandering over those mountains, learning how to see. That's interesting, Dad. Maybe you could take me there finally. Show me the place. Mm -hmm. Reading, I'd like to see it once and for all. I don't think that's a good idea. Too many obstacles to contend with. It's still just a train right away. Of course, Holly, but what I mean is that there are obstacles for us personally. You know that. I'd just like to meet my grandmother someday, my aunts and uncles. I want to see where you came from, you and mother. I could take you outside New York City. I hiked all that area as a young man, too. Undercliff, Tenafly, Spite and Dival. It's not the same. Well, there must be lots of other things I could share with you. There are many possibilities right here in Hartford. I, there must be something. Don't you care about any of those people back there, Dad? Don't you wonder if they're alive or dead? Well, of course I do. Look, I, I care for all of those people in a way that is natural for them and for me. My father was a difficult man. You must understand this. He didn't want what you might think of as love. He wanted something else. It was as if there was a window open every time he was in the house, he was letting the cold in. He liked it that way. As for your uncles, they and I just enjoy a friendly rivalry and competition. That's, that's how we assert that we stand alone. <laughs> like, I don't want to talk about this stuff. I just, I just want just... to get to know you better. Well, surely that shouldn't be necessary. You already know me as well as anybody ever has. I hope that isn't true. I really do. Well, you, you don't think I confide in Bill Williams this way, do you? You don't think I gossip with Marianne Moore about the tensions between your mother and my family? Those people are your closest friends. Well, at least your closest correspondents. I'd assume they know something about you. But you shouldn't be concerning yourself with my problems. You're off to college soon. You should be telling me all about your big plans for yourself. My big plans are to go over to Donna's after these chores. Beyond that, I expect we'll go to the movies later and possibly be so bold as to get something at the diner. No, Holly, I want you to be thinking bigger than that. I want to think bigger than that, too. I really do. After all, I'm the child of a poet who is famous the world over. A living mystery, a walking imponderable. You'd think that I could be at least somewhat intriguing or mildly charming or moderately charismatic on my own. Then again, I'm also the product of that great man, less famous wife, oh, I... a much simpler person of far less significance. Don't say such things. Your mother is not of far less significance. I guess it all just gets me confused sometimes. I keep thinking I don't know these people, and that makes me wonder if I know myself. Listen, let me tell you something. For years, people have been asking me the same thing, over and over, same thing. How can you be a poet and an insurance lawyer at the same time? They pose this question as though it's going to lead directly into my essence. And you know what I tell them every time? That this is not a revealing question by any stretch of the imagination. It wouldn't be revealing in the case of Charles Ives or Archibald MacLeish. It wouldn't be revealing with Sir Francis Bacon, and it's not revealing with me. What are you saying, Dad? I'm saying that those friendships you were asking about, they're, they're meaningful because those people understand me without explanation. You know, people like, like Bill and Marianne, they don't need any confession from me because they 
take me in through my work. They see the real me, and they see it because they exercise their vision, not because I make myself into some mathematical formula for them to tabulate, and that's as much justification as I feel I need make, even with my only child. All I'm saying is someday someone might really want to get to know you, Dad, the way they want to. It might be important to them. I'm sure it's a riot to be pen pals with an enigma, but it's not so much fun to rake up the leaves with one. What are you two doing out here? How can you gab away like this with our garden in utter disarray? This is nothing to get upset about, Elsie. It's merely a few leaves under the trees from which they fell. These leaves spoil my dainty besses entirely, Wallace, completely. It's all right, Polly. You can go and join your friends. Finally. Is there any pocket money in the drawer? Yes, you may take it and do as you wish. Well, I'd like to finish our conversation now. Can't now, Dad. I've got big plans to see to. Oh, I almost forgot this, dear. We, we need to agree on a time for that reporter from the current to drop by. He insists on a photo of the two of us. Oh, no, no, Wallace. I, I can't do that. Well, we're talking about nothing more than a, a pop-in on your part, Elsie, to, just for the sake of appearances. I can't be photographed looking as I do these days. I, I won't. I, I have no intention to. You don't have to tell him I have a headache that day. It's entirely possible I'll have one anyway. <laughs> There's no need for reluctance, dear. Don't you remember what a beauty you were when you were younger? I remember being told I was a beauty. Well, you were. You, know, you were so enchanting they immortalized you on the mercury dime. Your image will circulate with those silver wings forever. You could still be that beguiling muse if you wanted to. If you let your hair down again, you see. You know the problem with being beautiful. It attracts all kinds of people to you. Sometimes it's the wrong kind. Oh, I see. <laughs> and what would be the right kind? I'd like to know where others have succeeded when I might have failed. That is what you're insinuating, isn't it? I haven't bothered to think about that, Wallace. I never saw the point in tormenting myself. <laughs> Be thou that wintry 
sound as the great wind howling by which sorrow is released, dismissed, absolved, in a starry placating, we have that angry fear, the voice of that besieging pain, we may return to Mozart. He was young, and we, we are old. The snow is falling, and the streets are full of cries. Be seated thou. Wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Wait just a minute. Am I reading this right? You've got, see the blind and the lame in clay, there on the summer lawn. She, with her graceless eyes of clay, quick as a frightened fawn. I didn't write that. Our Jerry's wrote that. Yes, <laughs> but our Jerry's is you, Wally. <laughs> Kenneth Malone is you, uh, John Fistown. I'm just trying to fill up these pages, Libby, if you care to dash off a few more ballads of higher quality, uh, be my guest. Running and tripping into his way, whose legs are gone? <laughs> Please, I still have a few more for you. Yet. Oh, I can't wait, but will Hillary Harness have me oh, no! the Let me give you poets some advice! Poet! If the object of poetry is to woo women, and we all know that it is, never, never allow the poetry to detain you from the women themselves. Poet! This whole place is lousy with the <laughs> What are you on about, Ehrensburg? What am I on about? Rammies! Summer send off right this button. Can't you hear it? Giggling of eager Radcliffians rippling down the streets and up drained by its poets. Can you understand me or am I speaking too plainly? Poets! We've <laughs> got against poets, Spinner. I have nothing against poets if they're authentic, Mr. Living Good. <laughs> I won't call myself a poet until I've at least been to Paris. And then I've been flat broke in Paris, and I've seduced my way back from Paris with a life's worth of living exploits to versify. <laughs> what do you have to say to that, Stevens? Have you a rondo in reply? Yeah, I would love to go to Paris, you know that. Well, then drop your quill and run to the nearest boat. I don't have the funds for that now. That, 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 that never stopped a real poet. A real poet can bend the material world to his will by sheer power of his life. Okay. Okay. All right, okay. Enough talk with Posey Stevens. We'll make it to Paris in due time. If I have to paddle you there myself, but that would be another night, because tonight, gentlemen of Harvard, Pappy is Rampton's on the square, and our ship is sailing now. What's the matter? I don't know. They're both from Reading. Mm. That's all I know. Yeah. Must be some inclination. <laughs> Pennsylvania dog. Yes, that's it. <laughs> we're going, poets. Oh. And when we get there, we're taking stabs at any fine young lasses present. <laughs> Even fair, super gauge Stevens, you hear that? I stick no claim on civil gauge. Oh, 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 rather bold subversion of the truth. I am aware of Miss Gage. I find her pleasant. I have no designs on her. Who is this civil gauge anyway? Oh, I think you know Miss Gage. She's this unsinkable um, brunette, and she skips past the jury boarding house daily, oh, shouting, Liberty! Yes, yes, I have a spy! This is Yes, yes, that's it. We're going, poets! Look, I, I really must, must finish this. Oh, what? Dang, confounded reserve. Hey, people, don't tell me you're too irredeemably industrious, too, and we're talking new women drinking liberally this mm. evening and rapidly intoxicated suffragettes. Yep, it's okay, and I will finish this up. You'll meet us later? I'll, I'll be there just as soon as I'm done. So, Wally. 
I won't give up on you. No matter how hard you make it on me, I'll make you my offers of decadence until you're finally. If you're boxed enough to receive them, just remember that, my large headed friend. The state of dissipation will be. Running outside, I tell you, winner! Points, Walter! The worst! <laughs> Is this same 
wing of things, this nincompated pedagogue, preceptor to the sea, Crispin at sea, created in his day a duck of dunk. What count it was the apology of self, not stop the unforgotten. Crispin, the lutist, the fleas, the knave, the fane, the living stick, the bellowy creatures, cloak of child, the cap of spade, inquisitorial bosses, and
All right. Your brothers and sisters are waiting. Garrett Jr., Elizabeth, Mary Catherine, everyone's here. What are you waiting for? Can we talk about something for a moment? It's about this position that I've been offered. Uh, I, I was thinking, Father, it could be just as you said. It could lead to an entirely new life. Precisely, hence my excitement. But what if I didn't choose that life after all? What if I pursued something else for myself? I see. And what would that be? A literary life. I could try writing again, and not for the papers, like before, but poetry. Like, like I always wanted. I could take time to see Europe finally, to go to Rome and Aix in Provence, to speak French in France, and to write about it. We're saying that you would decline this offer and go willingly back into the ranks of the unemployed. I am saying. I go eagerly among the poets. That is merely a matter of semantics, Wallace, because the poets and the unemployed are one and the same. One is a code word for the other. Pardon me, I don't wish to lose my composure, but you know, I've been pushed to the limits of my patience. Yeah, there are professional poets in the world, Father. Perhaps in the world, Wallace, but not in our world. We have to work for the things we get, son. Work, 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 that hammer away. That's the path prescribed for us. What if I was not meant to hammer away like that? It's my belief you are. Garrett Jr. has never been able to do it. Garrett Jr., I will concede, doesn't have the stuff that you do. Elizabeth married old man McGovern so she could avoid- Elizabeth was not given the same opportunities you were. What, she, I wasn't able to send her to Harvard than the New York Law School like I was with you. And that's precisely because of the expense of paying for Harvard and the New York Law School and paying for Carlisle and Penn for your brothers. <sighs> it's because of the debt that I slammed myself into running my own firm and managing my bicycle plant while none of my boys, not one other than sober-faced John to some degree, had shown any intention of taking the bit in his teeth. Never mind lightening my low day of prison. Okay, okay. please, please, father. I'm fine. Please. So I can see that this is all too much for you. I'm fine, well, this is not all too much for me, and even if it all were too much, I certainly never admit that, because this is simply the way things are. Life is full of duty and responsibilities, wives and families. How long do you plan to put it all off? Listen to me, son. You know, I dabble in verse myself. I cherish writing, but it's not to be taken seriously by a real professional. It's unseemly somehow, effeminate in some way, ladylike. We're, we're, it's, it's not, we're not out for a picnic. This campaign is one of reality, and it depends on initiative, each of us on his own. You must realize this. I'll end up a dilettante. Half one thing, half the other fully neither. It doesn't matter what the percentages are, only that when they are added up, you are a man. No, you're, you're right, Father. It's better that I stand on my own. Wallace? No, no, you're right, Father. It's time to stop forestalling it all. It's inevitable. What, what are you saying? You're going to turn around and go right back to New York? Your mother will be devastated. Well, tell Mother. I'll make it up to her. <laughs>
case of meta men and para things. Meta men, is that what you mean to say? Yes, that's correct. Through para things, the meta men for whom the world has turned through the several speeds of glass. Well, the para things. Hmm? The para things, not through. Mr. Stevens, can we please put this nonsense aside? You must have more urgent matters than the typing of your scribbling. I would argue that these matters are very urgent, Mrs. Baldwin. To the business of this institution. To my personal business, which exists on a continuum with my business as a part of this institution. So, yes, Mrs. Baldwin, I would hope that after all this time together, you wouldn't still cling to this facile notion that one vocation is irreconcilable with the other. As I've said before, it makes no sense to see the man and not the shadow that he casts. It is a key to see them both as a single and unified it. Wait a minute. Is that my shipment for Monsieur Vidal? It's hardly our most pressing concern. Oh, boy. If you would, Mrs. Baldwin, I will make the preparation. I'll say this again, sir. I don't believe such items are allowed in this institution. I mean, really, Mr. Stevens can even fathom the irony of a fire at the home office of the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company? I can fathom any degree of irony imaginable. Now, Mrs. Baldwin, if you would locate the peach-infused variety, if you would, comes highly recommended with a cube of jaggery. consumed at the perfect temperature. The great thing in Paris, I imagine, is to walk from one end to another in every direction and to partake of its life as a concitoyen to the most intense degree possible from the inside. It seems the only place left in the world in which, notwithstanding all talk of war and politics, something gay and beautiful survives. I could imagine myself there, seeing just what any Parisian would see. I'd laugh in my sleeve at New York, far on the bleak edge of the world. Both places are alike, but there's a difference that is not to be bridged. Paris seems more than ever the center, if there is a center anywhere. One of these days, when the different things on their way from Peking, Geneva, London, Mexico actually arrive, I shall have exhausted the possibilities of life within my scope. I suppose that the simplest cure for that would be to leave Hartford. Indeed, tonight I'd like to be sipping a bock under a plane tree and listening to Madame's Paris from Madagascar. I suppose that if I ever go to Paris, the first person I will meet will be myself, since I have been there in one way or another for so long.
myself then, Mrs. Baldwin, thanks. Molly, what are you doing here? Do you mean here in your office? I mean here in Hartford. Aren't you supposed to be in Poughkeepsie now? I, I'm not just making idle conversation. What about your studies? My studies? What good are my studies when the Japanese are blowing up Christmas trees? What does that have to do with you? What does that have to do with me? That's my question exactly. With everything going on in Europe and the Pacific, why should I be tucked away in some dormitory with the sonnets from the Portuguese? No, you know what? I'm finished with all that now. I'm ready to move on to real life. Let's just stop all this nonsense. I'll clear my schedule. Take you back to school myself. How do you plan to do that exactly, Dad? Will you learn to drive finally, or will you walk me the hundred miles? Bobby, you will not talk to me like that. I won't tolerate that from you. We'll finish this conversation at home. See what your mother has to say about all this. Well, come on, Dad. We both know she won't have anything to add. But I have asked you not to talk about her like that. Why do you think I came here in the first place? Because our report is so remarkable? Holly, I don't understand this at all. I thought you loved it at Vassar. I thought you were having a wonderful time there. No, Dad. Vassar was your idea, remember? You picked it. I had no choice whatsoever. So that's what this is about? You're angry because you weren't allowed to choose which privileged college your parents would send you to? Yes, it is, in fact. When you extrapolate from that to thousands of other decisions made for me without my input, and when I realize that even when I'm not here at home, you have me living the life you scripted for me, yes! Yes, 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 oh, yes! I will lower your voice! No, Dad, I will lower This your is voice. my place of business. You will lower your voice now! Yes, thank you, Mrs. Baldwin. Everything is perfectly all right. Sorry for the disturbance. Just give us a moment, please. Listen, Holly. The, the connections that I made at Harvard, the, the, the people that I met there, they were some of the brightest and best friends of my life. Walter Ahrensberg and uh, Richard Binner, Pitt Sanford and Living Good. These people opened up a whole new world to me. If Walter Ahrensberg hadn't come back to New York and found me there, then all sorts of things might never have happened. I might never have written anything serious, for example. And that's not the slightest exaggeration. But those are the advantages you get and the connections you make from attending a school like that. You don't get them by lying around your hometown with some, with some what, some simple repairman you insist on seeing who has nothing more to offer you than the tools on his belt. Holly, you talk as though we dominate your life completely, when in fact we are the most permissive parents in your circle. Here I am practically begging you to study and paint and explore life without any adult commitment. Why would you resist that? Whatever happened to Walter Ahrensberg, Dad? How is that relevant to this discussion? I just want to know, why don't you speak to him anymore? I don't recall exactly. There was an awkward situation that arose, a misunderstanding. You mean there was a falling out? Uh, yes, I suppose. And you never resolved it, despite all of this value you place on the man's friendship. No, but it, it wasn't intentional. It just happened. He froze up, and then I froze up, and I just never found a way off my high horse. There you go. Isn't that relevant somehow? <laughs>
a couple days, every now and then, to remind myself of why I left. In the first place, that much is okay. Anything more? And I start longing for my rakish life in the city. I tell you, my old friend, the sheer vibrance one feels as a bachelor in New York is staggering. The contrast between our two extremes now is striking. <laughs> <laughs> so how, really, well, like how are things going? I am moving over to American bonding. When I get back, they tell me it's a step up. How about the poetry? Has the goddess of surety become your new muse? Did you notice I've been writing lately? Bitter. Is that so? I got a letter from him. From China, of all places. He's working on a book of verses, and uh, guess who may be publishing it? Aaronsburg! Yes! Walter is still at it, too! <laughs> <laughs> he had news on uh, Civil 2, by the way, Bitter Andy. Civil 2? Andy? Wally, you really don't want to know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me see if I can guess. Uh, this Gage married a friend of her father, approved by some plan of predestination, had us on the Mayflower. Her new name is Radford. Or Goodman. <laughs> and she now resides in a stately townhome on Beacon Hill. Close. Really? Uh, I was a friend of her uncle, owns an orchard or something, but in California. Is she teaching, maybe? That's all I recall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that entire stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, Wallace. I didn't mean to dredge anything up. <laughs> Come on. Don't get reflective now. See that? That girl there? It's Miss Elsie Maw. Or as she's also known, Miss Elsie Cashel, queen of our latest beauty pageant. Says that that wouldn't be self-obvious. And not a half bad warbler from what I've heard. Now, you may wonder about those surnames. And in fact, there could be a story there. Maybe some problem with her parentage, or maybe that's just how they do things on their side of the tracks. All I know is, I could forget a whole lot of whispering for a face like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hello, Miss Maul. Head living good? We had the four. Is this right? No, I come back from Harvard, set up my own successful practice, and still these women are too good for me. Come on, Elsie, sing one. <laughs> oh, yeah! Oh, I don't know. Elsie doesn't want to sing. Oh, we're in the sunshine. Oh, 
did you? What well, well, you sing as well as anyone I've seen in New York as a play, probably, probably better. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. It's quite kind of you. Do you go to the theater often? Yes, I do. Uh, all the time. Are you fond of it too? As much as I can be. What are the chances of you being in New York anytime soon? I would be happy to escort you to a show. Oh, no, yeah, please don't misunderstand me. I was merely saying if you happened to be in, 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 in the city, you know, I, I didn't mean to say anything. It's OK, Mr. Stevens. I, I didn't think that you did. How, how about this, Miss Small? I could write you from New York. Just to get us started, I could write you poetry, if you'd like. You know, I once intended to be a poet before my life took its current route. I've been meaning to start again. Something the matter? I just worry about how it would look. I wouldn't want anyone to get the wrong idea. Well then, just be careful not to reveal it to everyone. It'll just be our little secret. <laughs>
modernity and force, but doesn't possess the same shock as his commode. We can always ask the artist, he's just in the next room. Ah, the Matisse. It's among his most beastly, don't you agree? I tell you, I don't know how Walter managed to come back from the continent with that. Actually, I do with a deep excavation of his trust. Am I in your way, sir? No, 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 no. That piece demands sustained attention. Take your time. We haven't been introduced, have we? <clears throat> Dr. Bill Williams. William Carlos Williams, as I'm also known. This is Wallace Stevens. Oh. Are you Elsie Stevens? Why, it's wonderful to meet you. I've heard so much about you from your husband. Have you? Yes, of course. I mean, in fact, where is our giant? I thought I heard him just now. Giant? Oh, you sure you you know. Your Wallace is a bit of a hero among our smug little coterie. He's the only one that we can agree to congratulate when we're all done congratulating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> stodgiest dandy I've ever met, and the worst self-promoter since Galileo. I told him, whoa, enough of Rogue and those other obscure missalettes for Christ's sake. Let's find you a proper publisher before you're any closer to 40. Oh, you, <laughs> you must think I'm horrible. Hmm? It, it all comes from a place deep and abiding respect. It's all right. I don't claim to like all of my husband's writing. I'm more impressed with his work at the office. Really? Is it the, um, the lack of imagist precision that bothers you? Or is it his indifference to world affairs? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I only know that I find it showy sometimes. Showy? So pretentious, nonsensical, to tell you the truth. Oh, I, yeah, I, I agree that the poems can be obscure. Bill! Oh, my friends, I'm so delightful to see you. How are you? Walter Aaron! We met Mrs. Elsie Stevens. In fact, I have just a moment to go, Mrs. Stevens. Oh, I can't tell you how thrilled we are that you could join us at such long last. We were beginning to wonder whether you were entirely un process We had a hard time finding the right time for me to come. Oh, I see. Well, well Bill, did you know uh, that uh, when I read that Mrs. Stevens' husband not long ago, he was still rhyming breeze with trees like a schoolboy? <laughs> it was as if cubism had never wended its way across the ocean to find him and asked him, Wally, what have you been doing since our Harvard days? And he said, insurance. And I said, insurance, dear Lord. Wally, we've got to get you back into the business of risk. I tell you, his life would become entirely too comfortable for these kind of things. I rescued him just in time. Oh, my God! What's going on there? Oh, it's the Baroness again. Apparently, she'd been misinformed that she'd been disinherited by her senile benefactor. And after hearing this, decided to slash her wrists with a tube of lipstick. And then she passed over the bathtub where she was captured in rather a wristing sketch by the hand of Mr. Man Ray. And now she's awoken, caught a glimpse of that indelible caricature. And nearly drowned herself when you were about to see. <laughs> Presenting an obstruction to the bone that it served, but stood erect in you, has withered. A little palm tree of turned wood informs your spontaneous core in its immutable production. Magnificent, much more. Such complete integration. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Like the Falcon's box, it evokes even my own stoppages. <laughs> my highest compliment. I wasn't able to catch all of it, Marianne, but what I did hear was selective, free of distortion. Free of distortion, yes, Miss Moore. 
Have you met my wife? No, I haven't. Mary Ann Moore, this is Mrs. Elsie Stevens. Elsie, Miss Moore is a fine poet, one of the most original and truthful today. Nice to meet you, Miss Moore. Nice for me as well. Please. What do you mean? When you say you are Rollins' wife, please. <laughs> he most certainly is married, Baroness. This is his wife right here. <laughs> <laughs> Not so bad. Little stiff. But is she right for you? Could she possibly fulfill your needs? Elsie is a wonderful companion. How can that be? Baroness, you really must leave the Stevensons alone now. And I won't have anyone on me for Oh, Mrs. Stevens, you must understand the Baroness has suffered great trouble. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> and we do, we do have some eccentricity here at the salon, but of course, we observe the court. Uh, that is correct, Mrs. Stevens. Mm. No more than four in a bed at a time. That is four in addition to me. Mr. Duchamp is only kidding. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Told me you were married, Wallace. And I most certainly did, Miss Von Freitag Lauren, over numerous times. <laughs> but I can't be true. Uh, it is quite true, and very happily, Elsie and I have been together for many years now. I simply cannot believe it. <laughs> Mr. Ahrensberg, perhaps it's time for another recitation. Uh, Mr. Ahrensberg. Oh, yes, what a wonderful idea, Miss Marianne. Oh, Wallace, why don't you come over here and... Something pleasant for your wife. Yes, yes, of course, I would be happy to. Mm. Uh, as you know, I have written many poems under Elsie's inspiration. I sent so many back to writing before she joined me here. This particular piece of Verlier is from a more recent series. It is entitled Phantoms in Pine Woods. <clears throat> Chieftain, if you can, of as can a caftan of tan with henna hackles. Hot! Oh. Damn universal cock, as if the sun was blackamoor to bear your blazing tail. Fat, 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 fat! I am the personal. I am your world, your world is you. You ten foot poet among inchlings. Fat, be gone. An inchling bristles in these pines, bristles and points to Appalachian tangs, and fears not, portly as can, nor his hooves. Mm. Oh. Oh. So unresolvedly cryptic, mm -hmm. so pagan, perfectly. Yes, it's a course in this area. The slow fuse entangled with the gargoyle ring. I'm capsized. Yes, and I'm mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Duchamp. I do not understand. Mm -hmm. The man promises a poem about blue stairs, and he delivers a poem about blue stairs. Bear us attention, Mr. Stevens. The title must create a crash, otherwise there is only harmony. <laughs> Merely as a word for monopoly. More More And uh, interesting and contentious. <laughs> contentious even. Uh, Mrs. Stevens, what was your opinion? No. Oh, now come now. All opinions are welcome here. I found it affected, if you must know. So affected, and I don't understand why. I found it ridiculous, in fact. I found this entire evening ridiculous. Oh, well, 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 Mr. Stevens, you must understand this has been quite an unusual evening thus far. Mrs. Stevens, what could you possibly find ridiculous about this evening? I'll tell you what I find you're ridiculous. You Patagonian thing, you trenders. That is the fact that all of you attempt to characterize this triumph with more words. I can think of only one way to get to the truth of what Wallace has expressed so economically, and that is with my body. My body will slice through your verbiage and show the poet the true reflection of his incantation. Look at me, Lord. Look at me and see your own glorious sight. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it, all of you! Stop it! 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 Stop it!
Peter. Okay. Well, this well, I'm, I'm very oh, sorry. Yeah. It, 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 no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Over the other, 
but something subtler, a recognition that here too the universal interdependence exists and hence his choice and his decision must be that they are equal and inseparable. The poet has his own meaning for reality, and the painter has, and the musician has. It means something to everyone, so to speak. Reality is not that external sense, but the life that is lived in it. Let's go. 
feeling well today? I'm uh, feeling quite well, in fact. I find my mind to be firing rapidly. Well then, I hope you enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> Who else would there be? Uh, Mrs. Baldwin. Perhaps you need some rest. Yes, 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 well, yes. Perhaps a break from certain stresses. <laughs> Mr. Cross, by 
Well, that child's interested. <laughs> and you, young lady? I'm merely her friend, Ura. Uh, Ura. Enchanted. You're traveling with a biographer, for us? I am, Stevens. Oh, don't you have one, or are we still a bit too underground for all that nonsense? You know, Robert, I used to look forward to coming down to Florida, if only to avoid having conversations like this one. Oh. It was just me and my old rummy pal, or a couple of other barristers roughing it like soldiers. And you know what? I would rather sit around a fish camp drinking corn liquor with them than talk about meter with you, or about perspective with that, that damn Ernest Hemingway who's crowding out my little retreat as well, as if I needed a sighting of Ernest Hemingway to believe that I'd arrived somewhere special. Mr. Stevens, respectfully, it would be better if you didn't bring up Mr. Hemingway. Well, why shouldn't I? What, do you represent that sap? <laughs> if so, you can tell him that I'm not intimidated by his tales of safaris. You can tell him that I once spent a month in the Rockies eating nothing but what I shot and killed myself. Uh. You can tell him that uh, he is not the only original man poet left. <laughs> well, nicely done, Stevens. What are they so worked up about? Oh, that was, uh, was Ursula. You realize, Ura is Ursula. What of it? Ursula Hemingway. Uh, now she's staying with her brother Ernest over on Whitehead Street no more than uh, two or three minutes. Oh, all right. Well, let's, let, let's call this a night. No, the sun has barely set. Well, we'll do this another time, Robert, over coffee and aspirin. <laughs> Come on, well, let's go. Do you us. relax, Arthur. You're behaving as though there's a pack of coons out after us. He's just a copy boy from the Midwest. Say, has either of you fellas seen the Nochka? You might be interested in the plot. It was supposedly about some gang of Russian crooks on the run. But I couldn't take my eyes off Garbo. Gretchen Garbo, she's such a bombshell. She's my favorite of them all, at least my current favorite. Stevens! Oh, no. <laughs> Ernie, so good to see you. <laughs> Stevens! God damn it. <laughs> I know you're an old man, and damn, you're a pretty big old man, but I can't let you run me down like that. You've upset my sister. Oh, dear, then I suppose we'll have to settle things the way writers do when they've run out of work. I suppose we will. Just give me a moment to ready myself, Mr. Anyway. Right, ready. Boris, Boris, what, what, what do you think you're doing? I'm going to dispense with this matador. Well, he's a young man, Boris, look at him. You sure about this? Entirely sure. No, no, but then, Mr. Hemingway, won't you reconsider? Oh, I reconsider with an apology to me and my sister. Uh, how about Wallace? I can't say I'm entirely opposed to that. First of all, I mean this sincerely. I had no idea who you were. My comments were entirely inexcusable and out of character. I am very sorry. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Certainly, I most certainly can. Well, thank you, Miss Hemingway. Thank you very much. Very nice, Mr. Stevens. Very nice. Is there anything else? Uh, I got nothing for the other one. That's it! Come <laughs> oh, on, oh, 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 man, the lad is here! Oh, oh, gee, it's enough for Goodbye, good time, Judge. Boy, boy, this, this is absurd! Uh, um, Mr. Hemingway, I should mention that I. A great admirer of your perspective. It goes for me, Mr. Stevens. No, you know, man. Don't waste time in mystification. Pour it right into the cold truth. As to you, sir. You really don't know what you're saying, so you're saying it with authority. No! Moon is at the masthead and the past is dead. 
Her mind will never speak to me again. I am free. Her mind had bound me round. The palms were hot, as if I lived in ashen brown, as if the leaves in which the wind kept up its sound from my north of cold whistled in a sepulchral south. Her south of pine and coral and caroline sea. Her home, not mine, in the ever freshened keys. Her days, her oceanic nights, calling for music, for whisperings from the reefs. How content I shall be in the north to which I sail, and to feel sure, and to forget the bleaching sand. To stand here on the deck in the dark, and say farewell, and to know that that land is forever gone, and that she will not follow in any word, or look, or ever again in thought, except that I loved her once. Farewell. Go on. Talking with each other. 
I remember the right more than any talking myself. Our extended long distance courtship. Oh, uh, wasn't that extended? It went on far too long, Lois. Far too many years with me in Reading and you in New York, and you sending me letters and letters, and so many letters and so little real contact. It was excruciating. You know that's how I felt about it. You shouldn't bring these things up and expect to hear otherwise. You're right. I'll say that. I wish that weren't your point of view, but uh, I won't argue with you. You know, I do remember you talked to me about comedy somewhat accessibly. Did I? I don't know what you mean. I mean, when we were first together, whenever the top of the theater came up, it was <coughs> comedy, 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 you went on about. No, I, I think you may be remembering that not quite right here. It was probably commedia I was talking about. What? Commedia dell'arte. It's an Italian form from the 16th century. It consists of these slapstick sketches they call Lazzi, uh, performed by these madcap characters with masks. It always fascinated me for some reason. I don't know, the, the, the broadness or the coarseness I think I envied that. But it's not what you'd call comedy, per se, at least not in the modern sense. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me on that. No, no, that's not what I meant. I wasn't trying to correct you. Why don't you tell me what really happened with your hand, Wallace, honestly? I, I fell down a flight of stairs. No, tell me what really happened. Were you drunk? Did you embarrass yourself again? No. No, it was nothing like that. I was running, that's all. Running with the bulls. I'm sorry you had to hear that, Colin. It's okay. This little guy was bound to get up anyway. No, it's not okay. It was never okay. Hope you know that. Not for you, and certainly not for the baby. you should live somewhere peaceful. I have to think of Peter growing up with all that bitterness. Well, we're working on that. That's our goal as soon as I have enough saved up. Well, what about if I, if I help you with that? I, I could speed things along if you like. Do you want us to go? Is that it? No. Do you really want us out of here that bad? No, no, of course that's not it. It's been wonderful having you and Peter here with us, truly. Well, I couldn't accept any money from you. You made it clear what you wanted from me a long time ago. I knew your expectations from the start. Doesn't have to be that way. What way? So severe between us. You could change. I, I could change. I could be better for you now so that whatever happened to you with your separation or what have you, it wouldn't happen again. What are you talking about, Dad? You didn't have anything to do with that. I put a great deal of pressure on you. I realize that. It wasn't your fault. You were the one warning me. No, I should have supported you in whatever way you needed. I, I know that now. I, I know that now. Well, why this change all of a sudden? Are you not well? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm quite well. I, I feel fine. No, I know, I'm not young anymore, of course, but uh, I, I'm more productive than I've ever been. And I've had all the recognition, all the Prizes and awards I could ask for more than I could ask for. In fact, more attention than I'm comfortable with. I, I've been thinking about my private affairs, and uh, I'd like to see some things change. I'd like things to be different between us, like when you were younger and you were close. So what, what do you say? I saw a grand apartment house on my walk home the other day, close enough for regular visits. What do you say, you want to take a look? I mean it. Well then, yes. Thank you. Yes, I would. It wasn't always like this, you know. There were moments that were good. Like when we had you, and we'd, we'd take you to the park, remember? Princess Wong, Suffer Pale, the new whistle bird songs. I don't know. 
I'll give you lumps of sugar for the horses. You were fearless with them. But I, I remember all that. And in a few years, we can take Peter there, and, and you'll be the one to remind him. I'd better get him to bed now. Yes. Yes, of course, by all means. Good night, Holly. Elizabeth Park, just down the way there, glorious gardens. Now, see, roses, rows and rows. We can go there every day uh, if we want. Wallace, this is much more what I'd hope for. Now that we're settled, I feel so much better. I'm going to like Hartford very much. Thank you, Elsie. I am so glad to hear you say that. You needn't thank me. I should thank you for insisting on your transfer and leaving all your friends in New York for all of them. Thank you, buddy. You're welcome, Bobo. Well, if I was any closer to you, I'd be on the other side of you. <laughs> Marry me, and I'll never look at another horse. Oh, Wallace, you are crazy. What can you say? Yeah, what can I say? I'm a comedian. My little rose cap. Love me or hate me, I was born to play the fool. Is that really what you think of yourself? In fact, I do think that, even if no one else does. I always have. I am a checkered harlequin, and you are my tricky combina. Come here, my flower. Let me shake your tambourine. <laughs>
not too long ago, actually, but I, I did learn it. I did. It may surprise you to hear this, but most of my life, I felt certain that I couldn't help but fail people one way or another. Lived in constant fear of that. Of course, you know the, the literary contingent. They read my poems, and then they marvel at how such effete works could have been produced by such an oversized burger. <laughs> it was as if they felt that I, I'd failed them and betrayed them by not being the, the pale esthete that they had in mind. And then on the other hand, was the executive branch, whom you don't know. They'd be dumbstruck to find one of their own trifling with such a girlish hobby as verse. I could feel them wondering how I could risk being seen as a, a, a dandy, a sissy, a hedonist, a fuck. And by all accounts, I was cerebral, detached, snowman, incapable of warmth or feeling. Uh, I felt I had to prove myself to them, to all of them, and to you, Bill, except that I never could answer the preliminary question, which was prove myself as what? Was I the man among men, or was I the, the dainty rogue, the effeminate fraud? That occupied me for many years, until I finally decided I couldn't prove anything to anyone. I was a mass of contradictions, and everybody else would just have to come to terms with that. And all I could do was view the world through my blue glasses. Well, I can't argue with the word of that. Well, I can, but in view of your condition, I won't. Just get better already, will you? Give me a chance to come back here and listen. Yeah. Holly, so nice to see you, love. Dr. Williams, thank you for coming. Bill. Holly. Paul Bill. I'll try to, Bill. Did you know that your father once wrote a poem in my honor? No, I didn't it, know that. It wasn't in his honor, Helen. It was an homage, one might say. It was a parody, a dismantling. It was a kind of copy. He took four lines that I wrote, and then he expanded on them with all due credit noted. It was a satire, more than anything. It was a work of great admiration <laughs> by you and one of the true honors of my life. <laughs> Nuances of theme by Williams from my El Hombre. It's a strange courage you give me, ancient star. Shine alone in the sunrise, toward which you lend no part. Shine alone, shine nakedly, shine like bronze. It reflects neither my face nor any inner part of my being. Shine like fire, with mirrors, nothing. Lend no part to any humanity that suffuses you in its own light. Be not chimera of morning, half man, half star. Be not an intelligence, like a widow's bird or an old horse. Lovely, absolutely lovely. I'm sorry I'm late. I was trying to get Mother ready, but in the end she just wasn't up to leaving the house. She wanted to be here, though. Oh, you shouldn't have to go back and forth like this. Holly turned to take care of both of us. There's no life for you. I don't mind. Well, I'm sure Peter minds. No boy his age wants to be in the hospital every day. He's only eight, Dad. He thinks the whole thing's exciting. Besides, you know, Peter adores you. You're his greatest enabler. That wouldn't happen to be my latest box of imports, would it? I don't know. 
I thought it might have said rude or something or other oh, parents, right? Mrs. Baldwin sent it along from the office. She thought it might cheer you up. Mrs. Baldwin always was a great anticipator. Okay. We had candy violet petals. You can't let them sit too long. I get these from a confectioner in the sixth of Rundy Small. I think if they're any good. You can smell them through the box. You know, they're going to retire me. If I don't get back to the office soon, a little notoriety won't hold me up forever. That Pulitzer might buy you a few more years. No, the Hartford's really strict about such things. Oh, Dad, they're never going to part with you. You're their conversation piece. <laughs> Besides, I think you should retire. You could travel like you always talked about. You could finally go to Paris yourself. No, Holly, I, I couldn't do that now. Yes, you could. We could go no, there together. No, Holly. Yes. No, no, Holly, listen to me. I couldn't go to Paris anymore. It's too late for that. Of course it isn't. Once no, you're no, done, no, there's no, no reason. No, what I mean is that, that the real Paris could never match the Paris that I've built up in my mind all these years, no matter how grand it could be. I can only think of it now how I've, how I've figured it all these years. And yeah, I, I was saying to, something like this to, to Dr. Williams. A little while ago. That, that just doesn't matter because I, I've finished becoming who I am at long last. I'm, I'm happy about that. And it's one of the great advantages of being really old. You know, I'm, I'm like a puzzle that's finally acquired its last piece. Oh. You, you give that to young Peter to why off for me. You can give it to him yourself when he's here. No, 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 you do it. Only be sure to call him Jujubes or something from the Lower East Side. Okay, Dad, I will. There, there's something else I'd like you to do for me, something more serious. Let's not talk like this now. No, no, I'd like you to stay close to Elsie. You understand me? I, I know that she can be difficult, but she's not impossible. You just have to take your time with her. Uh, learn what you can offer each other. And just never stop trying with her, right? I can do that, Dad. Promise me? Yes, I promise you. I'll do it. Good, good. Thank you, Mom. Yeah, you know, I, I know I, I... I never told you enough about my family, and I'm sorry for that. You had every right to ask about that, and I shouldn't have denied you. And you know, we were all very close when I was growing up. My brothers and sisters, my grandmother, my parents, you know, there, there was such profound connections amongst us all. I never thought that we could break apart. But, uh, I can't help thinking of them here. Thinking of my, my mother and father, how they must have felt when they reached this point where I am now. You shouldn't be talking like this. You should be thinking more positive thoughts. No, 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 this is, this is positive. It, it feels good to think back on them after all this time. And, and you should know that uh, I never blamed your mother for her hostility towards them. My mother and father never thought she was good enough, and they made sure that she knew that. I can hardly blame her for resenting. But Elsie never knew my mother as I did. She never saw her when, when I was young, so so fresh and doting, so, so vigorous at the piano. She never knew my father, how hard he worked, how sincere he was, how fragile and broken he became, how distraught when he realized he didn't have enough money to send my youngest sister Elizabeth to college, to, to Vassar, however. That's where he always dreamed that she would go. I was always so distraught thinking of them waiting for me to come and visit and me too stubborn to go home. And now I, I can't tell you what I wouldn't give for just one more chance to, to race into that old house and hear my mother say, there's my boy! Push my brothers out of the way and have her running her hand through my hair. 
those moments are gone. Oh, I can't get them back. Nobody gets them back. That's why we're so lucky to have found each other again, you and I. And why you must cling to your mother any way you can, for as long as you can. created the time and place in which we breathed. 